Right, thank you very much. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for bringing us again today for this Bible study. We thank you for the help we have received thus far. Thank you for where you brought us to last week, even as we are looking at your provision for our deliverance. Thank you that the death that is required for us to be free and discharged from the law of Mr. Flesh, law of sin and death, we couldn't have provided that death in ourselves, but that death was achieved through the body of Christ. Father, this moment we are praying that the light of your word will keep shining on our hearts. We pray, oh God, that as we study the word of God again, the truth will set us free. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. We ask that your word will come to come with simplicity, to come with clarity, to come with grace. Let your word come with a convicting power. Let the Holy Spirit breathe upon us, particularly this afternoon or this morning. We're just trusting you, God, that all those that are joining us in different places and who have been following this study, we ask that, Lord, none will go again struggling uh, to live the old nature that Christ's life will become our lives. Thank you. Thank you because you will do much more than we can ask or imagine according to your wisdom and according to your riches and glory. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brad Derrick, for leading us. And we thank God for the song that our brethren from Canada have brought to us again. Not I, but Christ. Uh, that song continues to be thematic for us as uh, we have come to know that there's no other life that actually can please God or can grow to fulfill the purpose of God if it is not Christ that is living his life within each one of us. Uh, last week, if you will recall, we came as far as we are looking at what is God's provision for our deliverance. We have been looking at victory over self. And we came as far as I think we came to page 64 in this, uh, uh, the Bible study book itself. And we're looking at what has God done. And the said uh, in the first segment of that, when we're looking at knowing this, he said the prerequisite for deliverance is death. We looked at that from Romans chapter 7 and we saw that only death can actually put to end our miserable life, that impossible road to heaven. The life that Mr. Flesh had actually the tyrant had actually subjected us to. Uh, Romans chapter 7 as we read said, the evil that is in me is actually uh, what is making me to do what even I don't want to do. And we were reading scriptures, we saw that uh, the only way to put away the evil is to bring it uh, out uh, to the elder. So we read Romans chapter 6 as uh, our beginning passage, and we had studied to look at the price I mean, the price Christ paid, the price of death for our deliverance. And we came to that point where we were declaring what the word of God says to us. Uh, he said, you are dead. And we saw that God was not saying you will die or you should try to die. He says, you are dead. We read Second Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we read verse 14. We read Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. And we began to study Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. 
I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. Now, so today, we would like to go ahead to begin to take this, the, the, the section D, uh, still on that page 64. What is the effect of your death with Christ on the cross over your relationship with uh, your self life or with Mr. Flesh. These are things we began to look at and we shall build on it, trusting the Lord to help us, uh, before we get to, uh, the number four point, the new Christian life, how it works. Uh, so let's turn to our Bibles. We thank God for our sisters that will be helping us and along with Brother Dari, uh, Sister Jenna, uh, you'll be reading for us and the uh, Sister Sarah, that uh, Jenna comes to us from California and uh, Sister Sarah comes to us from Belize. So we'd like to, uh, please turn our Bibles. We'll start again from Romans chapter six, verse six and verse seven. And we get as far, we also jump to verse 14. And then Romans chapter 7, verse 4 to 5, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4. We're taking all this because we, we believe that you followed us, uh, since we started looking at this particular portion. Uh, if you were not here last week, then, uh, we would like you to quickly uh, just note that the scriptures that we are building upon uh, is uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5. We said, we thus judge that if one man died for all, then we are all dead. But that in that Jesus died for all, he died as so, so that those of us who now live, will no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. But in Romans chapter 7, which we are going to pick up again, it will give us, it will take one little step back in order to build for today. And the Lord helps us. So can we turn to Romans chapter 6? Romans chapter 6. And we are looking at verse 6 and verse 7. You see, we have not picked Romans chapter 6 from verse 1 yet, but let's begin from that verse 6, just to start to note what God has said about us. Romans chapter 6, Sister Jenny, you would like to start that passage for us. 6, 6, 7, and then verse 14. Yes, brother. Reading from the New King James, Romans 6, beginning at 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Mm. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Okay. That's Romans chapter 6, 6 to 7, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Romans 6, verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8. Now, I mean, and verse 14. Before we go on there, can we pick it? Uh, last time we were reading from a contemporary English version. Um, let me check whether Sister Sarah has contemporary English version or Brother Dari. Uh, if you have CEV, we'd like to look at verse 6 and verse 7 from CEV. And um, so please help me check if you have contemporary English version. Uh, Brother Dari, do you have it? Yes, sir. All right. Can you read it? Romans 6, 6 from Contemporary English Version. We yeah. know 
that the persons we used to be were nailed to the cross with Jesus. This was done so our sinful bodies would no longer be slaves of sin. 7. We know sin doesn't have power over dead people. All right. So let's note that what we have been dealing with, he said, we know that the persons we used to be were nailed to the cross, you know, with Jesus. And this was done so that our sinful bodies will no longer be the slaves of sin. So that our sinful bodies will no longer be slaves of sin. Because we know that sin doesn't have people, I mean, doesn't have power over dead people. We know that sin does not have power over dead people. Right? Thank you. Now, uh, so we are noting that from that passage, it said the the man, the person we used to be, the person that used to live inside this, our physical body, that used to do whatever he did, something has happened to it. And this was done as it was crucified with Christ on the cross so that our sinful bodies we no longer, our bodies that have been liable to sin, we no longer be the slaves of sin. For we know that sin does not have power over dead people. Now, before we pick uh, verse 14, that had also been noted there, the effect of this death is that our body, we no longer we no longer become slaves uh, of sin because we know that death normally releases a man from the power of sin. Now, let's see whether that can come to us again in an amplified version. Can we check, Sister Sarah, can you read Romans chapter 6, 6 to 7 from the amplified version, amplified classic, if you have it? so that we can pick it together. Praise the Lord. Romans yes. chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, from the Amplified Version. We okay. know that our old, unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. Verse 7. Yeah. For when a man dies, he is freed, loose, delivered from the power of sin among men. All right. He said, we know that our old unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him. And this was in order that our body, which is the instrument that sin had used, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil so that we might no longer, no longer be the slaves of sin. Now, and I wanted to note that we are not saying we are no longer going to be slaves of sin when we get to heaven. No. So for when a man dies, he is freed, loosed, delivered from the power of sin among men. It is among men that you no longer be a slave of sin. Because the person we used to be, the person that used to be uh, the slave to sin is now dead. And this happened through the body of Christ. Uh, this is what we have been 
establishing. And we need to keep noting that before we go away from there. Now, is it possible for us to get someone to read that passage from Living Bible for us? The Living Bible. Um, Romans 6, verse 6, verse 7, and then verse 14 from the Living Bible. You have a Living Bible there? Yes, sir. All right. Try to bring it out for us. Your old evil desires were nailed to the cross with him. That Mm. part of you that loves to sin was crushed and fatally wounded so that Mm. your sin-loving body is no longer under sin's control, no longer needs to be a slave to sin. Mm. For when you are deadened to sin, you are freed from all its allure and its power over you. All right. All right. Before you read verse 14, let's note one a word that is coming out of the living Bible for us there. He said in that verse 6, he did say that uh, that part of you that loves to sin, that part of you, the man that is inside, that is, he loves to sin. Even when you don't want to sin, he is addicted to sinning, was crushed and fatally wounded. How did it happen? It was nailed to the cross with Jesus. So that your sin-loving body is no longer under sin's control. No longer needs to be a slave to sin. Because when you are dead to sin, according to that verse 7, you are freed from all his law and his power over you. Now, this is the first thing that we want to note, that the effect of our death with Christ on the cross is that we are dead. Is that the one that used to be uh, 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 controlled by the sinful nature, that nature is crushed, fatally wounded. And when the Living Bible put it, it was crushed and fatally wounded, that means Death actually has occurred and is being crushed out of your life by the death that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross of Calvary. Now, this we cannot overemphasize it, is very critical as we go on in our studies today. Now, verse 14, you want to pick that also from the Living Bible, then we shall move. Yes, sir. Sin need never again be your master. For Sin now, mm-hmm. need never again to be your master. Please take note of that now. Sin need never again to be your master. The reason is because you are no longer. Yes, Esther, bra- Brother Dory. Mm-hmm. For now you are no longer tied to the law where sin enslaves you. Mm -hmm. You are free under God's favor and mercy. You are no longer tied. We are no longer under the law of sin and death. The law of that our husband is canceled. You are no longer under the law, but under grace. Which means... Sin has no reason, no, no need actually to enslave you or to, or to send you on little, little errands. Sin can no longer do that for you. Let's please read that also from message. Is anybody able to help us get the message version? And let's pick, uh, Romans chapter six, verse six, verse seven, and then we'll go down. To read verse 13, I mean verse 14. Yes, any message for us? Sister Janet, do you have a message? Yeah, let's ask Sister okay. Janet read. Romans 6, beginning verse 6. Yeah. From message. Could yeah. it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ, mm. a decisive end to that sin-miserable life. 
no longer captive to sin's demands. Mm. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. Oh, okay. You go to up to verse 8. And you try to verse 14 now. Yeah, go ahead. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living right. in freedom of God. Okay, maybe we should ask you, Sister Jenny, to just read it for us from verse 11. Thank you. You know, in message, it comes together. Yes, and just read from that verse 11 down onto verse 14. We know that when Christ, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Mm. Never again will death have the last word. Mm. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but mm. alive, he brings God down to us. Mm. From now on, think of mm-hmm. it this way. Sin speaks a dead language. That means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. Mm. This means you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't Mm -hmm. give it the time of day. Mm. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Mm. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time. Remember, you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living After under all. that tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Jenny, for this. The sin can't tell you how to live now. After all, you are not living under the law, under that old tyranny any longer. You are living in the freedom of God. So the first effect that we are dealing with as we are looking at Romans chapter 6 is that you are dead. And being dead... The old nature that we used to carry, the person we used to be, has been crucified with Christ. And this happened so that our body, which used to be the instrument of sin, might no longer be a slave of sin. That it might be free now, from now henceforth, it can no longer be used to carry little, little errand for sin. For when a man is dead, is freed from the power of sin. That's the first point that is the effect. And then we are now seeing that because you are not under the law of sin and death anymore, you don't need to even give him a little space. You don't even need to run little errands for him. He can't use your mouth anymore. He can't use your leg, he can't use your hand, he can't use anything that concerns you anymore. It is no more available for Mr. Sin to use. And according to that message said, Sin speaks a dead language to you now. Sin has no connection again with you because you are no longer under that law. But now you have been brought into a new life. Say this is what Jesus did. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and you are alive to God. This is what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary for us. Now, before we conclude on that section, let's go now to Romans chapter 7 and look at verse 4 and verse 5. Romans chapter 7, verse 4, 5. Sister Sarah, would you like to read Romans 7? 
from the New King James that we normally start with. Romans chapter 7, verse 4 to 5. Amen. Romans chapter 7, verse 4 to 5. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even mm. to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Yes, Amen. thank you. Wherefore, my brethren, you also, you have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. The New King James said, you have become dead to that law through the body of Christ. All we are saying is that uh, we couldn't have finished with the death of our old man in ourselves if we still want to be married to another. So we noted that we then need someone else to carry him out, to take him out of us. And we read through our scripture last week that God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sin, our iniquity. Our iniquity, the iniquity of each one of us was laid upon him. And the only reason why that was done is that we might be free to be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit unto God. So for when we were in the flesh, when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, the old King James said, the motion of sin, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. When we were, I wanted to take note of the, the way the Bible is speaking now. When we were, why would the Bible say when we were? Is because we had become dead through the body of Christ. Our old human nature, the person we used to be, was crucified with him. Was crucified with him. That we might, you know, be free to live another life and bear fruit unto God rather than bring forth fruit unto death, which had been our lifestyle all along, right? Now, can we put that from the Amplified Version and see how we can uh, analyze um, Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 4 and verse 5? Uh, let's speak it from Amplified, Brother Dari. You can try to bring that up for us. Yes, sir. Verse 4, likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death as to the law through the crucified body of Christ so right. that oh, so that now yeah. you may, yes, sir. so that now you may belong to another to him mm-hmm. who has raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. When we were living in the flesh, mere Mm -hmm. physical lives, the sinful passions that were awakened and aroused by what the law makes sin, were constantly operating in our... What the law makes sin. Mm -hmm. Oh. We're constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs, in the sensitive appetite and wills of the flesh, so that we bore fruit for death. Hmm. Wait, uh, wait. Let's take it little by little again. Please flash the Amplified Bible for us. I want all of us to be able to look through that. In case you don't have it, the screen should be left so that we can have that scripture to study. Said so likewise, my brethren. 
you have undergone death. As to the law through the crucified body of Christ. Is that making it clear? We were crucified together with him. Our old self, the person we used to be, the Bible says was crucified with Jesus Christ on his cross. And this is the ground on which our Galatians 2.20, which we sank now, is going to come up again. Now I said, likewise, please take note, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly dealing with this because it's a very fundamental issue that you've got to get. If you are going to walk in victory, if you are going to walk, you know, steadily with God and grow and grow in stature in every area to become like Jesus. He said, likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death. Please take note of that. I want you to believe God. He said, you were also dead. He didn't say you will die. He didn't say you should try to die. Something has happened when we got included in Christ and he went to the cross. And as he was crucified, as his body was being crucified, our old nature, that stubborn, rebellious son that we carried over the years was crucified with him. So he said, now, likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death as to the law through the body, through the crucified body of Christ. Please take note of that. If this was not to be done, then Christ need not to die. If this is not what God has done, then Christ does not need to die. Now, why did he do that? Let's pick it up again. So that, you know, the word so that means for the purpose of. Say, likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death as to the law through the crucified body of Christ. So that. In order that now you may belong to another. We belong to Mr. Flesh before by birth. We have remained under the uh, tyranny of the flesh over the years. In fact, the Bible says it was by law. It was the law of our marriage to the old nature that made it impossible for us to do otherwise, apart from provide and uh, bring forth fruit unto sin. He said, but now you had undergone death as to the law, though, I mean, through the crucified body of Christ, so that now, henceforth, you may belong to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit unto God. So the death that has occurred of our old nature is for something else to happen. It's for us to belong to another. I kept saying that in the past two weeks. That if you felt that you are delivered from Mr. Flesh and you are not married, you are not connected, you are not bind to Jesus Christ as your new husband, then you have wasted that death. You have wasted the purpose for which he went to the cross. He went to the cross so that I, Brother Gile, may belong to another, belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that I may bear fruit for God. Henceforth, Henceforth, your body is no longer to become an instrument for Mr. Sin to use it to produce anything, not even to run a little errand, not even to uh, allow your tongue or your mouth to say something that is only for Mr. Flesh. He no longer has that right. You are married to another, you have belonged to another now. My head, my, my, my body, my neck, my toe, my mouth, 
everything about me now belongs to Jesus. He has bought me with a price. I've been bought with a price. So he said that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit unto God. Now go to that verse 5. He said, when we were living in the flesh, wow, I want God to make that your testimony as well. When we were living in the flesh, that is, when we were living the mere physical lives, when we are living like an ordinary person, when we have not experienced the new life, when we have not been delivered from Mr. Flesh, he said when we were living in the flesh, mere physical life, the sinful passion that were awakened and aroused up by what the law makes sin, we are constantly operating in our natural powers. Sin was always constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and the wills of the flesh. So that all we did was that we were producing, we were bearing fruit for death. Every man that has not come to the place of death through the body of Christ They are subject by law to sinful passions. Imagine that you have been saying you will not be angry again, you won't be angry again. It is not whether you want to be angry or not. When Mr. Flesh comes demanding anger, you have no other thing to do than to give it to him. Passion, passion for sin, passion for uh, sex, passion for uh, pride of life. They walk in our members you know, by law, when we were living in the flesh, mere physical lives, the sinful passions that were awakened and aroused all by what the law makes in, we are constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and the wills of the flesh so that we bore fruit for death. Now, look at verse 6. Please help us at verse 6 so that we can have a a kind of completion. But now, but now, I want you to know that something has happened. Something about you has changed. The authority that used to push you up and down to live for sin is no more here. And there is no law anymore. The law of sin and death has been discharged as far as you are now concerned. You are now having a brand new life to live. And in this new life, we are told that sin speaks dead language to you. Even when sin comes knocking and says, can you do something? And say, sorry, how can I? Who was dead to, to sin? How can I live in that? It's not possible. My mouth is now bought over for Jesus. I can't use it to abuse somebody. I can't use it to get annoyed. I can't use it to bring evil words out of this mouth anymore. It's not possible. I can't use my leg. I can't use my eye. I can't use my hand to do anything to run little errand, even for Mr. Flesh. It is enough. But now we are discharged from the law. And we have terminated all intercourse with it. I just love this passage. We have terminated all intercourse, every relationship with it. Having died to what once restrained and held us captive. We have died to that. So now, we serve not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the spirit in newness of life. The life we are going to be producing now is being prompted, is being organized, is being activated by the new man who lives in us by the Holy Ghost. I don't know whether you follow to that point. That is the effect of your death, you know, on the cross with Christ. Now, let's take uh, Colossians 3 verse 4 to conclude that a discussion as we go ahead. I'm looking forward to uh, trusting the Lord that as you are following step by step, 
The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth that we are noting here is that something happened at the cross to the person we used to be. If death did not occur to the person we used to be, then we could not ever hope to be free at all. You may fast, you may pray, you may impose some uh, rules and regulations, but when Mr. Flesh is ready again to collect his dues, you have no other thing to do than to give it to him. You are bound to do it. It is by law that you do it. But God himself knows that there's no need asking you not to sin when you are a slave, when you are married to Mr. Flesh. It's not going to work out. So sometimes you go to church and they say, don't be annoyed again, don't be annoyed again. How can someone who has not known the death of Mr. Flesh, how can he not be annoyed? Even while you are preaching like that, even the preacher himself is preaching that, that has not been free, that has not died to Mr. Flesh. As he's preaching, can you imagine that somebody just said or misbehaved in the congregation, he gets annoyed. Because Mr. Flesh takes every opportunity eh, to manifest, to do what he wanted to do. But the Bible said, we are now dead wherein we used to be held. And we are now free to live a brand new life eh, prompted by the Holy Spirit to produce fruit unto God. So the fruit that will be coming out of your life now is the fruit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. It said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. All of those things that we are going to ask you to look at again. That's what you will be producing now. Your life will be producing something that is sumptuous, something that is a, a, a sweet smell, a sweet fervor unto God. The aroma of Christ will begin to break forth in your life. And I now want to say that any discipleship that does not begin with this experience of death to the old man will be an endless effort. It's like you are training uh, a, 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 a you are training a dog eh, to become a sheep. Will you ever achieve anything when you have trained the dog very well and you have? fed it and you have taught it, it will only become a more smart dog. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when Jesus said you must be born again, he was simply saying, Mr. Flesh has to be terminated. Mr. Flesh has to be put aside so that you can have a brand new opportunity to be married to another so that you can produce and bring forth fruit unto God. Now, Colossians 3 and verse 3 and 4. I always want you to read verse 3 and 4 together because if we pick verse 4, it may not give us the basis. So let's pick uh, Colossians 3, 3 to 4. Uh, Sister Sarah, you are the one to read that now. Colossians 3, 3 to 4. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Yeah. For ye, for ye are dead, mm. and your life is hid with Christ in God. Mm. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, two things we need to note there before we pick it from other versions. Say for, uh, you are dead. That's how, um, that's how King James put it. King James said, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. For you died. That's the New King James. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him 
I'm trying to get it in the language of King James that uh, Sarah read. Let me pick it up again. He said, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, please take note of that now. Christ, who is our life. There's one need that may God help us to arrive at, particularly this evening before we go away. Now, if the persons we used to be was crucified with Jesus on the cross, so that the body that used to be the instrument of sin might be free, might no longer be slave to sin. The question is that, so what life are we going to be living now? What life is going to be operating in us now? Who are we married to now? That's the question that we have been looking at. Say, so in order that you might be married to another, you might belong to another, even to him who died and for your sake rose again. But now, coming in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 and 4, it became a little clearer. What did he say? You died, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life? When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's check it from other versions very quickly. Uh, Dari, can you check it from Amplified Version? Uh, amplified version. Let's see whether we can get something out of it. Amplified version from verse 3 and 4. Yes, sir. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died. Mm. And your new... My God. Now, wait. wait Daddy, don't, don't rush at that. Yes. He said, as far as this world is concerned, as far as this world is concerned, you have died. Can you accept that? Can you let that sink deep into your heart that, oh, so as far as this world is concerned, Brother Bile is dead. As far as this world is concerned, Jenner is dead. As far as this world is concerned, I am dead. You have died. Now, go on reading now. So as far as this world is concerned, you are dead and your new Real life is hidden with Christ in God. Uh huh. When Christ, right. when Christ who is our life appears, yes. then you also will appear with Him in the splendor of His glory. Amen. All right. So this new life that we have now, the one that has exchanged with the old life that we used to carry, we are now discovering that scripture says, this new life, this your new life now, this your real new life now, is Christ. Is hidden in Christ in God. All right, thank you. Um, Sister Jenner, can you check your message? If you have the message, can we try the message? And um, yes, let's try the message. <clears throat> Verse 3 and verse 4. Yes. Yeah. Your old life is dead. Your, your old life is dead. Let's, let's repeat that. Your old life is dead. I want you to see the finality with which the word of God is coming unto us here. And you notice that we are not just making it up with one verse. You notice that we are coming from Romans. We have gone to uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and said, we just judge 
that he won't die for all them all were dead. Now we have moved from Colossians, I mean from Second Corinthians, we have come to Galatians. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. We need to note that. Now, and I wanted to see us now coming to Colossians. Colossians say, your old life is dead. The person you used to be was crucified with Christ. So he's dead. So Sister Jene, your old life is dead. Aha. Uh-huh. Your old life is dead. Is dead. Your new, your new life, which is your real life, yeah. even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. Wait, wait, look at that, Sister Jenny. Let's look at that. He said, your old life is death. The Jenny that everybody used to know, something has happened to that Jenny. What happened to her? She's dead. How did she die? Through the body of Christ, through the crucified body of Christ. That's what finished the old person that we used to be. Now, this old person that we used to be, look at how it is now. Whatever it was, whether she was timid, whether she was always argumentative, whether she was reckless, whatever happened to that genre is finished. Now, this happened so that you can belong to another. This happens so that you are not just a vacuum. You will belong to another, even to Jesus, who died and rose again for us. So Colossians chapter 3 now says, you are dead. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life. Now, on the outside, people are thinking, that oh, Jenna is still there. Tara is still around. Sarah is the one walking up and down. But no. What they are seeing is just the physical body that you used to live in before. Now, a brand new person is now inside. A brand new person has come now. Your real life, your new life, which is your real life, even though it is invisible to spectators, people will still be thinking, ah, it is that... uh, uh, lady we used to know, it is that girl, it is that boy, it is that uh, Shola, it is that uh, a Mark. No. He said, though it is invisible to spectators, spectators don't know that something new has happened to you. They don't know that something has changed inside of you. But your real life is with Christ in God. He is your life. Now, Please read verse 4. Uh, Sister Jenna, you are still now reading verse 4 for us. He is your life. Yes. Christ, your real life, remember, shows yeah. up again on this earth. We will show I, up. I think, I, I think you need to remember this. Say, so when Christ, your real life, remember. All of us must keep remembering that. When you are going to talk to your wife next, don't forget that it's no longer you. It's no longer your old life. When you want to respond to your children, don't forget that the the mother they used to know, something has happened to that woman, is dead. Those persons that that has offended you before, the person they have, they have offended is no more here. There's a brand new person here now, which is Christ, and nobody has offended him yet. He has not taken offense with anybody. So if you call up that person that offended you, you say, ah, how are you? I just want to greet you. I want to thank God for you. He said, what, what happened? Why are you greeting? Uh, the person you used to have quarrel with has died. The person here now does not have any quarrel with you. In fact, he doesn't know that you have done anything wrong with him. No. 
is a brand new person here now. He said, your real life, when Christ, your real life, may God cause this to, to be clear to you, that the new creation life that can grow in discipleship, that can become conformed to his image in every area, is Christ, but inside you. Say, so when Christ, your real life, remember, remember, and you see, when I came across the word remember here again, what it brings back to me is Romans chapter 6 that we read the other time, as we read it from Phyllis Modern English. Brother Mark always helped me to read Phyllis Modern English in the Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I don't think, I don't know whether any of us has Phyllis Modern English in our collection here today. Uh, Romans 6, verse 6 from um, Phyllis Modern English. Let me see whether I could get it since I can't get Mark around now. Romans 6, verse 6 from the uh, Phyllis Modern English. It says, Let us never forget that our old self died with him on the cross. That the tyranny of sin over us might be broken. For a dead man can safely be said to be immune to the power of sin. Let us never forget this. Let us never forget this. That our old self died with him on the cross. That the tyranny, the tyranny of sin over us might be broken. For a dead man can safely be said, to be immune to the power of sin. So now we have come to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4 says, When Christ, your real life, your real life, remember. So may I beg you, brothers and sisters, before we leave here, the essence of this death that took place through the body of Christ is so that in exchange And for that old nature that we were carrying, you carried it for 30 years, you carried it for 40 years, you went everywhere with that life. And all you did in 40 years is to produce fruit unto death. Even when you want to do something for God, Mr. Flesh hijacked it. Even when you thought you were singing, anytime you sang and people seemed to to enjoy your singing and they clapped, Mr. Flesh, quietly inside, came to claim and said, you see now, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good, that's you. So the old nature does not leave you to go free for anything. He must claim it. He must take the glory. So Mr. Flesh, whether you're a preacher, whether you're a singer, whether you're a businessman, is busy causing you to produce fruit unto himself for death. But now it's dead. Your old life is dead. Remember. And your new life, which is your real life, which is Christ, is with Christ in God. Christ is your life. And so, Jeanette, please speak verse 4 again and read it for me from your message. I only interrupted you. Colossians 3 and 4. Colossians 3, 3 and 4. Yes. Your old life is dead. Your new Mm -hmm. life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He Mm -hmm. is your life. You see your life. When Christ... Your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth. You'll show up too. The real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. That's good. Now, why is he saying like that? Even when Christ was here, when he was walking here for those 33 and a half years, when we said for a little while, he was made lower than angels. When he was here, people 
just took him as the son of carpenter. They took him for granted. They thought he was just a mere man like themselves. They didn't know that he carried a life that is different from theirs. But Jesus was content. So anytime they ask him, he said, the son of man, the son of man. There are very few times you hear him say the son of God. Because he is content with that obscurity. So even me, myself, he said, the life that is in me now is Christ. Is the, is the life that Christ has come to live in us. He said, uh, uh, the real you, when that Christ, when Christ, your real life, shows up again on this earth, you will show up to the real you, the glorious you. So the picture we are getting is that the person that I am inside is obscure. Spectators don't know about it. They greet me ordinarily. Anyhow, and I don't blame them. That's okay. But the man that is inside, the man that lives inside here me, is the one that is, is the real life. Christ himself living his life here. And so when he appears, that's when the real life that I carry, he said the real you, the glorious you, we also show up to. He said, but for now, be content with obscurity. Carry this life, but in an ending verse. Go about with it anyhow. But don't forget that the inner man that we are talking about is the one that is being renewed day by day. It is this one that is growing day by day and becoming conformed, being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. All right. Now, let's move out of this, if we can. Let me ask uh, uh, Brother Dari to now read the summary under that uh, point number D that we have been looking at. Yes, sir. You are dead, and he that is dead is freed from sin. Yes, the sir. embodiment of sin, the flesh, has been destroyed. The stronghold of sin over your life has been shattered. The works of the flesh in your life are the things he uses to have a strong hold over your life. That hold has been destroyed. Sin has no more power over you. The flesh shall no more be your master. You now have power to say no to the flesh, and you are free to obey Christ. Amen. You are free now to obey Christ and to bring forth fruit unto God. Now you are free to do that. Now my mouth, my leg, my eyes, my every part of my body can no longer be yielded, can no longer be submitted as an instrument for sin. That regime has finished. I'm now under a new regime, and the regime is the regime of grace, where I have capacity to live for God, to walk right, being prompted by the Holy Spirit that is at work inside of me. Now, what then should be your response to this truth? I've been trying to state this truth over and over again. What should be our response to it? How do we respond to it so that this is not just theory. It becomes a living reality from day to day. It becomes a reality that you yourself you are walking into. How do we respond to this? Now, let's pick our scriptures again. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5.15. We read 5.14 last week as much as we could. But now let's go on reading verse 15. But, you know, for you to be able to uh, follow well, it's always good to read from verse 14, verse 15. Um, yes, we are not getting to verse 17 today. 
I'm hoping that God will bring us there as we go ahead. Yes. So who will take that for us? Sarah, can you start with Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and verse 15 for us at this point? says, for the love of Christ constraineth us mm. because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay. And, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live it unto themselves, mm. but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Sister Sarah, for that. He said, for the love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge, we have agreed that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all. And that he died for all. So that they which live, people like me and people like you, should not henceforth live unto ourselves, unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. That's good. Thank you. I want us to pick that from other versions so that we can build it. Uh, the issues I'm dealing with today requires that we should, what should be my response? What should be the response to what Christ did on the cross for your life? If you have come to this experience, if you have now found that, yes, that death that Jesus died, he died so that your old man can die. And that has happened. All the passages we are reading it didn't say you should try to die. It didn't say you should pray to die. He said you are dead. As far as this word is concerned, you are already dead. So let's read that 14 and 15. Now from uh, Amplified Bible from Dari. Message from Sister Jeanette. And then good news. Sarah, if you can bring out your good news, we'll try to read it again. So let's speak 2 Corinthians 5, 14 from Amplified. Quickly. Yes, sir. Amplified. For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us because we are of the opinion and conviction that if one died for all, then all died. And he yes. died for all so that all those who live might live no longer to and for themselves, but to and for him who died and was raised again for their sake. Good. He said, the love of Christ controls and urges us. Actually, it impels us. I love the word impel because it is working from inside us. If you have ever understood what Christ did on the cross, there should be a deep conviction in your heart. He said, we are of the conviction. We are of the conviction. We have the opinion and conviction that the one died for all, then all of them died. And he died for all. Jesus died for all. So that all those who live might no longer live to all and for themselves. We no longer live for Mr. Flesh to operate. You are no longer alive only to be running errand for the old nature. You are not just alive to be living the mere physical lives. You are now alive to live for him who died and was raised again for our sake. Now, if you remember how we read Romans chapter 6 from message, he said when Jesus Christ died, he took sin down. He took sin down and was buried in the tomb. When he rose up, 
He brought God down to us. He brought a new life to live inside of us. So, Mr. Flesh was taken down. You know, the way the language seems to me is as if he said, the, 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 the regime of Mr. Flesh was brought down. And a new life, a new regime, a new, a, yes, a new government was set up. We are no longer under that old one that has been brought down. We now live a brand new life now. So the love of Christ controls, compels, and impels us because we have this conviction that if one died for all, then all died. And in that he died for all, he died that those who now live should no longer live for themselves or live unto themselves, but to him and for him who for their sake died and was raised again. Now, can we pick message, Sister Jenner? Uh, let's look at your message from verse 14 and verse 15. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15 from message version. Yes, sir. Our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life. A far better life than people ever lived on their own. Amen. Hmm. Thank you. Christ's love has moved us to such extremes. His love has the first and last word in everything we do. Our firm decision is to walk from this focused, this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. May God give you understanding of this. That because died, because Jesus Christ died for us, then we all died. We shared in that death. Now, what's the implication of that now? What is this focus center in which each one of us should now be living? What should be this central focus that each one of us should now begin to walk from? He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life, a resurrection life, a life that is far better, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. This is what Jesus Christ did. This is why he died on the cross, that I and yourself, wherever you are sitting down to listen to this uh, Bible study today, whether you are sitting alone, whether you are together with your family, or whether you are, uh, you are, you are sitting in your car and you just park aside to, to go through this Bible study, or you are in a discipleship class, or you are in a Bible study class, or you are in a church meeting, where all of us are going through this. I want you to know that you, as an individual, the person you used to carry up and down is crucified with him. The man you used to be has been put to death. Let us never forget that. But that the reason why that happened is that you might be made available to another. You might belong to another. That you no longer live for that old nature. You no longer live for yourself. But for him who died and rose again, that we may have a better resurrection life to live. So from now on, I want to now read it from uh, the New King James. I just read it because I just feel that it's very important for me to read that. He said, and he died for all, that's verse 15, that those who live should no longer. What's the meaning of no longer? No longer means no longer. It means not any moment longer. 
That is to say, that which we did for Mr. Flesh, we cannot any moment longer allow it. Which means from now on, from this moment, from this Bible study, you can no longer, you ought no longer to live for self. You will now find out the man for whom I am going to live now, the man that died and rose again for me is the one I'm going to be married to, I'm going to be uh, connected with, I'm going to live for him. So the implication of what has happened to us is that we will no longer live for the flesh, but we live for him who died and rose again for us. No longer. Now let me try to see how did uh, CEV, Contemporary English Version, has put it. Brother Dari, can you check the CEV you read for us before? If you can get something out of it. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, we are ruled by Christ's love for mm-hmm. us. We are certain that if one person died for everyone else, then yes. all of us have died. Have died. For And Christ did die for all of us. Uh-huh. He, he died so we would no longer live for ourselves, yeah. but for the one who died and was raised to life for us. You know that since last week, I kept emphasizing the fact that he died for all of us so that we might be married to him so that we can bring forth fruit unto God. If after Jesus died for us and you have received forgiveness of sin through his blood and you seem by the grace of God to have entered into the rest from the power of sin, and you are not married to live for Jesus, then you have cheated him. You are cheating him for living for anything else. The liberty he has given you from the life of sin, from the power of sin, is so that you might freely serve him. Say, God has delivered us from our enemies, that we may serve him all the days of our life, in holiness and righteousness. That's what Luke chapter 1 verse 74 and 75 said. So if any man has experienced in any way the deliverance from the power of sin, from the devil, from Satan, from sickness, and all that the cross of Jesus Christ actually did to us, it is so that you might belong to another. It is so that you might live for him who for our sake died and rose again. And that henceforth, you no longer live for the flesh. You no longer live for yourself. For there's a life to live now, a resurrection life. And from the message version we have read, it's a better life. It's a higher life. It's a more glorious life. Sincerely speaking, I want to tell you, what you used to be when you live for the flesh is a useless, impossible road to heaven. You can see that the life of the flesh broke your marriage. It scattered your life. It made you restless. You are from one trouble to another, all simply because Mr. Flesh will not allow you to enter rest. But now that that life is terminated, God has offered us a higher life, a resurrection life, Christ's life, Christ's life. So that love has impelled us. That love has compelled us. That love has constrained us that if Jesus went to the cross to die so as to finish our old nature, take away the the evil that, that we have been struggling with, what else? For us, and he's not asking you, please take note now. He's not asking you to marry him so that he can cheat you and, and enslave you. He wants you to be married to him that you may have a higher life, a more glorious life, a resurrection life, a victorious life, a life of rest. If 
any man is listening to me in the course of this Bible study, what God offers you, he said, he said, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's the reason. That's what he came to give us. So, henceforth, let's please put a very important emphasis on the word henceforth. Or no longer live unto themselves, but to him who died and rose again for them. Let's go quickly and look at Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. And we'll read it again, Galatians 2.20. Hmm. Dari, can you start with Galatians 2.20? Yes, sir. New King James Version. All right. I, being crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And mm-hmm. the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. Wow, I just beg that the Holy Spirit will bring light to show you what we have been talking about. Say, Christ is your life. Christ is your real life. Remember, The life that God has brought you now to live is Christ's life. You don't share that again with anything else. Now say, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. You know, please, uh, can you bring out the old King James so that we can take old King James and bring one or two words there. I have been crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. That is said too from all the passages we have been reading. Nevertheless, you see me walking up and down. Nevertheless, you see me living. Yet, not I. I want you to take note of the word. Yet, not I. People think, ah, it is uh, Emmanuel that is living. They think it is Samuel that is walking up and down. They think it is uh, Brother Mark that is living. They think it is uh, Sarah that is walking. He said, yet not I. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. Oh my God. I want all of you to know that scripture. But Christ lives in me. It's very interesting I, I, I want to note that he said, not that I'm trying to live for Christ. It is Christ who has come now to live his life, but in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, let's try and see whether we can get that passage uh, from other versions that could give us for that light that will help us. But don't forget, nevertheless, I live. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you see me walking up and down. Yet, not I. It's not I. It's not me again. It's no longer I that lives. Now, can we pick it from uh, any other version? Uh, I've been asking you to help us check CEV. Or oh, good news. Um, yes. Sarah, do you have CEV? Or you have good news? CEV, brother. All right, CEV. Yes, read for us, Dari. I have died, but Christ lives in me. And I now... I have died. Wait, wait, sir. Wait, sir. Mm-hmm. I have died. I pray that that is a simple... As that with each one of us. I have died. You know that Colossians chapter 3 say, as far as this word is concerned, you are already dead. 
I have died. But Christ lives in me. Brother, go ahead. But Christ lives in me, and hmm. I now live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good news. Good news. Sister Sarah, have you got your good news? No good news today? Yes, I do. All right. Can you read it? In our area, there's no electricity, so the data did not allow me to unmute, but I'm here. Praise God. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Lord. So it says, so I have been put to death. I have been put to death with Christ. Christ. That's good. That's good. That's good. Go ahead. I have been put to death with Christ on his cross. So that it is no longer I, Sarah, who live. But it is Christ who lives in me. This life, this life I live now. I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave his life for me. Good news. Wow. That's good. I have been put to death. Please bring out that good news. I have been put to death with Christ on his cross. I have been put to death with Christ on his cross. So that it is no longer I who live. I hope that is clear. For it is Christ who lives in me. Oh God. May the Holy Spirit cause that to be declared to you. That it is Christ I live now. This life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I live now is not my life. It's Christ who lives in me. Now, I want to pick it from the, uh, let me try to see, Phyllis Modern English. Let's try Phyllis Modern English. And Phyllis Modern English says, as far as the law is concerned, I may consider that I died on the cross with Christ. And my present life, my present life is not that of the old I. Please take note now. My present life is not that of the old I. But the living Christ within me. Hallelujah. The living Christ within me. The Christ within me is actually living. He's living his life. And so the life you see me live now is not that of the old I. My present life is not that of the old I. It's not the one that my mother gave back to. It's not the one that I went to uh, secondary school with. It's a brand new life now. And this life is the living Christ living within me. So the bodily life I now live, the bodily life that I now live, I live believing in the Son of God who loved me and, and what did he do? And sacrificed himself for me. That's the life I live now. It's not my life. So when I'm going to the laboratory tomorrow as a scientist, it is not the life of my old eye that I'm carrying there now. It is the life, the living Christ that is living his life within me. So the one of the implications of this thing that God is going to help us to deal with as we go on in this study is to recognize that something happened at the cross that took away 
our life, our old life. Listen, and when I say the person you used to be, it's not just the, the father, the, the sinful one, the one that used to argue, the one that used to fall into sin, the one, no, not just that. Even the one that looks good, but is natural, God took it out so that we can have a different life in together, all together. Christ, the living Christ, living within me. Let me read, read that again. Let me read that again. He said, I died. As far as the law is concerned, I may consider that I died on the cross with Christ. And my present life is not that of the old earth, but the living Christ within me. The bodily life I now live, I live believing in the Son of God who loved me and sacrificed himself for me. I'm drawing that life from him step by step. So it's not, it's not outrageous. When I ask Jesus, I say, Lord Jesus, as, as you are the one living in me now, what will you have to do? How do you solve this problem? And your husband just spoke to you, thinking she is just speaking to his wife that he used to know. Not knowing that there's a brand new life here, Christ living within. Before you will open your mouth, you are going to be asking him inside. Say, Lord Jesus, how do you want to answer this now? How do you want me to do this now? So, you know, it's the living Christ that is inside. It's the life of Christ. And when you begin to allow that to happen day by day, oh my God, very soon they will say, "Ah, why are you behaving like Christ like this? They will not know that it is actually Christ. You are not just behaving like Christ. Christ is living his life out in your mortal body. May God bring you to that experience in the name of Jesus. Now, so the response to that is to keep knowing this, is to keep recognizing this, is to keep walking in this reality. I'm, I'm, I'm discovering that our time today, again, is going so fast. It means we may not be able to reach uh, Becoming Like Jesus today, but it's okay. Wherever we get to, uh, we're dealing with an issue that we cannot rush. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will cause his word to, to, to take root in our heart as we are building in this discipleship experience. We made this as a condition for discipleship because if it is not Christ's life in you, you can't grow to become like him. There will be no resource within you that will make you to be like him because you don't carry his gene, you don't carry his life. Right. So let's quickly pick that up. I still wish, let me see whether message, Sister Janet, can you want to read message Galatians 2.20 for us? I know sometimes they are long together, but uh, this time uh, you start, please, from, uh, read from verse 19 all together so that we can pick up. Galatians 2.19. Yes, we're going now to 20. What actually took place is this. Mm -hmm. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God. And it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so Mm -hmm. I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. Mm. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. Mm. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion, and I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. May the Lord make this message clear to you. 
It is not all these rules and regulations you try to keep. How many of us we fasted seven days, seven nights just to overcome Mr. Flesh? Did you? You put yourself under very strict discipline. How far did you go? If the law will have dealt with Mr. Flesh, Christ did not need to die at all. We should have just we should have just wake up every morning, recite all our commandments and say, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. And if it has worked, but he said it didn't work. It didn't work. He said, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God. It didn't work. I don't know any of you that it worked for. I've never met anybody who has actually experienced liberty through rules and regulations. When we were under that law, when we have not met Christ, we made rules for ourselves. You must not smile too much so that you don't lose your holiness. We kept distance about 12 meters to weave the sisters so that we don't enter into loss. And yet, 12 meters away, your heart has traveled there. It didn't work. The rules and regulation didn't work. Whatever we tried to do didn't work. Because there's no how Mr. Flesh could have improved itself. It's impossible. It's an impossible road to heaven. So God himself knew that Mr. Flesh cannot change. He said it's desperately wicked. Nobody can know it. It's too sick to be healed. Death is the only solution to it. And Christ actually provided that death. He said Christ's life showed me how to now please God. It's Christ's life. My friend, the only person that can please God is Christ. I want to say what I like to say again. Only Christ can be a Christian. Did you understand what I said? Only Christ in you can be a Christian. So if it is not Christ living in you, forget it. If it is not Christ's life operating in you, just forget it. You can't, you are going nowhere. So what God decided to do, is that it will no longer be I that is living. But Christ lies. He said, indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no important. It is no longer important that I, I, I bear, I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I'm no longer driven to impress God. I'm not even trying to impress God. Because all the years I tried to impress God, was God impressed? All the years I tried, you know, you know, some of us are very pious. You are pious. You know, you are pious, but you are not holy. You try to do everything methodically, and yet Mr. Flesh is behind it. Some of you, you have rules, I must pray at 5 a.m., I must pray at 4 a.m., And you tried. You tried all of those things, but it didn't change anything because that's not what will give you the solution. It's Christ's life. You will only be saved by Christ's life. It is the fruit that will come out by Christ's life. It is when you get married to Christ that this is life will begin to produce fruit that is pleasing unto God. So he said Christ's life is what showed me how to. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine. Sister Jeanette, can you pick it from that? The life, the life you see me living. I want you to pick it up from that and help us to complete the passage. The life you see me living is not mine, Uh but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Will you read verse 21? It is not clear to you. Excuse me. Uh, is, is, it, is it not clear to you that to no, go back? Yet. 
you have job, you have jumped a line. There's a line before that. He said, the life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh-huh. I am not going back on that. Aha! Don't go back on this matter. Is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God? I refuse to do that. Mm -hmm. I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule-keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. Don't go back on this matter. Don't go back to that rule-keeping, miserable life. Christ has brought us to where he has been longing for you to be. It is not that whole rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion. And you know what it means. It is not that you are actually only in your heart, but it's only when you see people coming around, then you change. You try to, you try to become something so that uh, uh, the peer pressure they are putting on you. No. When you see a Christian, the kind of Christian that we are looking for, the kind of disciple we are looking for, is not a man who is living supervised holiness. We are not looking for people that if you don't say, uh, come and pray, they don't pray. We are not looking for that wheelbarrow Christian that you are the one pushing him externally. We are looking for people that life is sprinkling forth inside their heart. Carry them to hell if possible. They will still live a Christian life. Because it is Christ that is springing forth in them. Take them to any environment. The light will still shine. Because it's a light that is inside. They are not pretending. They are not acting. They are not dramatizing. They are just living. Christ is the light that is at work in me. Praise the Lord. Now, the time has uh, come again to an end for us this day. And I'm, I think we just have to tie ourselves together on this. Now, take note that we have come to verse 20 of Galatians 2.20. Romans chapter 6, from verse 1, verse 2, verse 11, verse 13, will be something to read, but I will not dabble into it now. It's important, but I would like to leave it until we come back next week. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. I want each one of you to rise from here and never you forget this. That the person we once were, the person you used to be, is crucified with him. And that as far as this world is concerned, you are already dead. And because death has occurred, your body that used to be an instrument, your mouth that used to speak anyhow, is no longer a slave to sin. It has now been made free, it has been bought over and for Christ to use it. So you now know that you are belonging to another. You are married to another. Even to him who died and rose again for us. And that this love of Christ leaves us no choice. It impels us. We know that he won't die for all, then all have died. In that he died for all. (coughs) He died that those of us who now live should no longer live for self, but for him who died and for our sake rose again. I know you would like to go ahead, but time will not allow us to do that. So, We will stop here again today and then we will pick it up by God's grace when we come next week and we are picking from that Romans 6. I want to spend a bit of time 
on Romans chapter 6, so that by the grace of God we pick it little by little as the Lord will permit us. But before that, let me ask Darren to read the summary under that number E uh, to a point. When we come back, we can still pick it. Can you read for us? Yes, sir. Christ's purpose is dying for us is very clear. It is so that you should not henceforth live for yourself, the old man in you. If you refuse to bear any fruit of sin for Mr. Flesh now, you are justified. Even physically speaking, a dead man is free from the control of sin and the devil. Self and Satan cannot influence or oppress a a dead man. And you have actually died. You were in his, Christ's loins, when he died and paid the penalty of sin on the cross. If a snake swallows a frog and the snake then dies, the frog also dies. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Romans 7, 4. But why am I still alive? It is not Mm -hmm. I that is alive, but Christ that lives in me, walks, talks, eats, reads, etc. in me. Mm -hmm. It is for a purpose that he lives in me in order to bear fruit for my new husband, Jesus Christ. Christ lives in me in order to fulfill his purpose. My response to this truth is to refuse to obey myself or live for myself constantly every day. But my victory must not stop there. My victory will not be victorious just by saying no to self and stopping there. Saying no to yourself is like sweeping and making your life clean and empty as in that parable told by our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke eleven twenty four to 26. We will read it later on. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I think we can stop at this point. He said, but why am I still alive? It is not I that is alive. The life I live now is not that of the old I. It's no longer that of the old I. But the living Christ within me. Christ that lives in me now is the one that wants to walk in me, that wants to talk, that wants to eat, that wants to do everything in me. For it is Christ that walks in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And this will bring us to Colossians later on. He said, the mystery of the gospel is this. What is that mystery? Christ in you. Christ living in you. Christ walking in you. The hope of glory. We will stop here again today trusting that the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary on our behalf will never be wasted. He said, I have decided not to go back on that. I will not go back on that. I will not repudiate the grace of God. I will not waste the death that Jesus died on my behalf. Perhaps as we pray today, God is pressing on your heart to say, you have died. As far as this world is concerned, you have died. You have already died. Every sinful thing that Mr. Flesh did in your life before is finished. Actually, you pick your pen now and you write off all your sinning partners and say, sorry, your friend is dead. There's a brand new man that lives here and he does not deal in such things. You are not doing anything strange. You are only being correct. If you call all those people that you quarrel with before and say, sorry, the woman that used to quarrel with you, something has happened to her. He was fatally wounded and crushed. But thank God there's a new life here now. Christ lives in me. And Christ doesn't have growth with anyone. I want to, I want to love you again. You will see a change. You will have testimony coming back. It's no 
longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me, in me, in me. Jesus is the life in me. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. We're going to pray on this. Let's pray. The reason why Christ died is to take down the old tyrant that lived in us, Mr. Flesh. And when he rose, he rose that we may live a brand new resurrection life, his own life inside of us. Will you like to pray and say, Lord Jesus, this that you've done for me, let it compel me to live for you. Let it compel me to let your life be the only life that is being manifested in my mortal body from now on. Lord Jesus, please step into this life and take over, take over. He died so that he can find a space to live inside of you. And since the man that we used to carry up and that is now dead, can you sincerely ask Jesus, now I want to be completely married, connected to you, living only for you, living only for you to live your life. Please pray that prayer. Even if you are in a study class, maybe several people, forget everybody around you and address yourself to Jesus personally. And if you are alone where you are sitting down to listen to this scripture, to the word of God, now please focus and tell Jesus, say, no, I didn't see it like that before. I thought I'm going to keep struggling, struggling. Say, no. You can't struggle to please God. It is my life that will please God. But inside of you, give me space now. Can you give Jesus space? Can you, don't go back on this matter. The day that he died was so that our old nature, our flesh might be crucified. And in that he rose again, He rose again that we might live a brand new life, a resurrection life, which he comes to live in you. Can you give him that space and say, Lord Jesus, let it be you living in me now. Let it be you inside of me. Let my husband come to touch this new man, Christ, at work in me. Let my children come to meet a different father from now on. Lord Jesus, please walk this out to the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer today. And as many as are stepping into this experience, as many as letting you now live your life within them, Lord, I ask that the light of your glory will begin to shine upon them and that they will walk into this reality uh, on a day-to-day basis. As many as are crying to you and say, Lord Jesus, step into my life. Please take over from them. Let today be a termination. We said last week that the cross is a terminus. Something ended at the cross and something begins at the cross. Lord, at the cross, our old man died. But at that same cross, there's an exchange. Christ's life came in to live in us. Lord, let this become the experience of your people everywhere they go, whether they are anywhere, oh God, in Africa, in Europe, in US, in Canada, in Belize, in Central America. Lord, whosoever, because your death is for all, that all those who now live no longer live for themselves or for you who died and rose again for them. May this harvest become more and more deliberate in our day to the glory of your name. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Over to you, Brother Dari. Wow.
Thank you, sir. Brethren, we thank the Lord for how he has visited us this day. We thank the Lord for the word of God that, you know, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives.